geography. Um, I just kind of wanted to let you know, just to touch a little bit why I geography this year. Um, a lot of it just has to do with the fact that during when we try to improve this image and likeness that we are of God in the image and likeness. And so many times we look to art to help us with that. So somebody say, well, I cannot do what's that have to do with Lent? Well, I hope that if you come to many of the fighting end of the whole series, that you'll have a stronger idea of what I cannot do has to do with Lent. But when I went to the monastery last weekend um, in Brian's Junction, and I said to Mother Abbas, can you say something to us about iconography? She says, oh, well, the first iconography was man. God made man in his image and likeness. So that encouraged me, too, um, for what we're about to learn in the next five weeks, and then again on Palm Sunday. So um, with no further ado, I know many of you have met Father Theodore Petrutu. Um, if you hear his beautiful accent and you wonder where he's from, he comes from Romania. What an accent. Um, he, comes from, he comes from the UP, um, and the Upper Romanian Peninsula. And, um, and uh, he's been serving as one of our chancellors here um, at our metropolis. And um, at the same time, uh, he has the parish of St. Constantine in heaven again, where Father Paul is today. So if we could all um, give him a, oh, one more thing too, before uh, I ask you to uh, welcome him. I just, because I don't want to forget later. How was the food? Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we would like to thank Katina and Aaron Couture uh, for providing you tonight. And also for the YL for helping us with our setup. Today, and Father Chandler, please come take the microphone. Thank you so much, Presidera. I'm so glad to be here with you. I wanted to tell you a little story about the accent because when my girls, I have two girls, they're eight, almost 18 and almost 20. And when they were little, one time his eminence was at our house, and I don't know how the conversation came about my accent. And when Nicole, who was probably five or six at the time, heard about uh, his eminence, talk about my accent, she goes, Daddy doesn't have an accent. He said, You have an accent. <laughs> so, you know, I guess we can't get rid of that accent. Thank you so much for inviting me, Presidera, and the community of St. Nicholas. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Um, the first time I, uh, I was asked to speak about the iconography was actually before we even started our iconography project at our church. It was in Ann Arbor. Um, as you probably, some of you might know, that St. Nicholas Church in Ann Arbor just finished their iconography in the church. They're getting ready for the consecration there. And Father Nick, while they were still um, doing the iconography in the church, asked me to speak on the role of iconography in the Orthodox Church. So this is the first time I presented it, and then it came to the turn for us to start our iconography project. We're about um, two-thirds completed, I, I would say. Um, and. Um, I found it important for the people to understand what iconography is about. So that's why I put this not very short presentation, but I think it, would be, it will be useful for all of you. Um, the way it was meant, it was meant at times to show certain things on the screen. Um, unfortunately, you can do that on, on, a, uh, on a projector screen, but not Nevertheless, uh, I hope it's useful for all of you. So, YouTube, TikTok, Vimeo, Netflix, 
Hulu, Amazon Video, you name it. I was looking today to see other platforms for pictures and videos, and it's a long, long list. The information society we live in produces a continuous stream of intrusive and rapidly changing visual stimuli. We are assaulted every day with, by images. Every single moment when we have an empty moment, we pull out our phones and we check. Images, images, images. The mass media makes it possible for images to be devoured like consumer goods. And such a continuous, rapid stream of pictures, as studies have proven recently, can have a disturbing effect on young and not so young people's minds. What is the cure? What is the alternative? I would suggest that one of the alternatives, as Presbytera pointed out as well, is meditation, prayer, and icons are an integral part of those disciplines. Orthodox iconography has a form which inspires serenity and a content which invites meditation. Iconography, I would say, began on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate and continued with Christ when Christ pressed a cloth to his face and imprinted his divine human image on it. According to the tradition, Luke the Evangelist pointed, painted, sorry, the image of the Mother of God. And also, according to tradition, there still exists today icons which were painted by him. An artist, Saint Luke, painted not only the first icons of the Theotokos, but also those of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and possibly others which will not, were not preserved. The mystery of the Incarnation is itself the crowning argument for the iconography, and makes acceptable the depiction of the Divine. By following this argument, St. John of Damascus could say, I have seen God in human form, and my soul was saved. He further says, in former times, God, who is without form or body, could never be depicted. But now, when God is seen in the flesh, conversing with men, I make an image of the God whom I see. I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter, who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation, through matter. The purpose of the iconography was from the beginning service in the church. Holy icons serve a number of purposes. They first enhance the beauty of the church, are a part of the liturgical life of the church. They teach us matters of faith and they intercede the grace from God. We will stop for each one of these four main purposes of the icons and talk a little bit about each one of them. First, it is the beautifying role of the icons. And that is the most obvious function of the icons. When you go into a church that has iconography, we would say, this is really beautiful. They enhance, obviously, the beauty of the church. Attention to this fact is called by a, a hymn that we are about to, to sing on the Vespers before the Sunday of Orthodoxy in just a few days. It says, the Church of Christ is now embellished like a bride, having been adorned with icons of holy form, and it calls all together spiritually. Let us come and celebrate together, joyfully, with comfort and faith, magnifying the Lord. How did the Russians get to convert to Christianity? The story is really an amazing one. Nestor Chronicle tells us how in 1998, Prince Vladimir of Kiev chose Greek Orthodox Christianity as a unifying religion for his people from the reports of how beautiful the services were that the Greeks celebrated in the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Emissaries returned with impressions of different denominations, but after taking part in that service in Hagia Sophia, Constantinople, they were overwhelmed and spontaneously declared, we did not know whether we were in heaven or on earth. Such splendor and beauty are not found anywhere on earth. 
It is impossible to describe. We only know that God was there among the people. Nearly a thousand years later, Dostoevsky wrote, Beauty shall save the world, connecting the beauty of the icon with the theology of the church. Now, we just sang during the pre-sanctified liturgy, now the celestial powers are present with us and worship invisibly. This, we know that God dwells there among men. The envoys say after they see, they saw that beauty of the Hagia Sophia. Orthodox Christians, inspired by this vision of heaven and earth, have strived to make their worship in outward splendor and beauty, an icon of the great liturgy in heaven. In the year 612, historians tell us, on the staff of the Church of Hagia Sophia, there were 80 priests, 150 deacons, 70 subdeacons, 160 readers, 25 chanters, and 75 doorkeepers. This gives us just a faint idea of the magnificence of the service which Vladimir's envoys attended. I know how many of you have been to Hagia Sophia. It really is beautiful. I've only seen it once like this, the way you see it in this picture, because most of the time a scaffold was in the middle of the church on purpose, I believe, to take away from its beauty. Those of you who have visited Hagia Sophia would see beautiful icons like these. This is the icon of the daisies and the balcony of Hagia Sophia. This is the icon of the um, Theotokos, um, the Platitera in the dome that was above what would have been um, the altar of the church. Now, what is beauty? The Orthodox Church believes that God is the creator of heaven and earth, that that creator is present in the world to his created energies, of his handiwork. It means this material world that we are surrounded with, being valuable and good, is an important means through which God expresses himself. The interior of the Orthodox Church is frequently very beautiful. The building itself is filled with the feeling of joy and an appreciation of God's bounty. Orthodoxy recognizes that beauty is an important dimension of human life. Through iconography, that beauty of creation becomes a very important means of praising God. Therefore, and this is very important, when we talk about the beauty of the icons, we have to understand that the transcendental content of the icon is not simply the physical beautiful, the icon is characterized as dogmatic, as we will talk a little bit later. Its content deals with doctrinal truth. It's not just about the beauty and those who judge Byzantine iconography with the concepts of classical antiquity or more modern time regarding the beautiful will only confuse things. That's why you're going to hear people say, well, I don't really like the Byzantine iconography, because they don't really understand what it's about. Those who are interested in art and knowledgeable about modern art can try and evaluate iconography using purely aesthetic criteria. However, apart from any such externally formal features in common, the very character of icons is far different than most of the Western art. The icon says Solrunness. It's a beautiful, great book. If you, if you uh, get your hand on it, read The Mystical Language of Icons by Solrunness. The icon is a holy object, the form being merely a receptacle for the content, and the content is determined by the holy scriptures and the traditions of the church. That is why the work process is marked more by discipline than by inspiration. Icons frescoes and mosaics are not mere ornaments designed to make the church look nice, but have a theological and liturgical function to fulfill. Second, the liturgical role of the icons. 
The icon has a liturgical function, obviously, is constitutes an integral part of the life of the service in the Orthodox Church. At the Seventh Ecumenical Council in Nicaea, it's kind of a long quote that I wanted you to hear because it's a decision that confirms that which is, <coughs> has become important in the Orthodox Church regarding the icon. It says, the Church Council proclaimed that next to the sign of the precious and lightning cross, venerable and holy icons made of colors, pebbles, or any other material that is fitting may be set in the holy churches of God, on holy utensils and vestments, on walls and boards and houses and streets. These may be icons of our Lord and God, our Savior Jesus Christ, of our pure lady, the holy Theotokos, and of honorable angels, or of any saint. For the more these are kept in view through their iconographic representation, the more those who look at them are lifted up to remember and have an earnest desire for the prototypes. Also, we declare that one may render to them the veneration of honor, not the true worship of our faith, which is due only to the divine nature, but the same kind of veneration as is offered to the form of the precious and lightning cross the Holy Gospels, and to the other holy items. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council declared that the icon is a means of worship and veneration. Like sacred hymns and music, the icon is used as a means of worshiping God and venerating His saints. As such, it is leading the soul from the visible to invisible. It's a portal-like. I'm going to talk a little bit later about that. From the material to the spiritual, from the symbol to the prototype or original which it represents. When we talk about the liturgical role of the icons, we talk about four aspects. Veneration, presence, liturgical time, and space. I'm going to go shortly and point out each one of them. Veneration. This is the simplest thing. We know what we do when we come to church. We go in the narthex, you get your candle, you light your candle, and we do what? We venerate the icons. We bow before the icon, we make the sign of the cross, and we kiss the icon, sometimes saying a short prayer. This is what is called veneration. It's not worship. That's where sometimes the Protestants are confused. So if they worship you, this is idolatry. It's veneration. In Greek, it's dimitiki proskinesis, which is according to icon and worship. Latria in Greek is due only to God. Second, presence. According to Orthodox tradition, an icon shall be honored because it manifests and actualizes the spiritual reality towards the faithful turn. In this way, an icon may be a reminder of God's presence and an aid in prayer. But when you look at an Orthodox icon, one that's it's written properly, <laughs> the eyes of the icons follow you wherever you are in the space. In front of them you move and the eyes are following you, giving you that sense of a presence, the pres a loving presence. It emphasizes that I-Thou relationship, the direct communion between these sacred images and the faithful. Third, sacred or liturgical time. Time in worship is so much that we can talk about, there's not enough time to talk about time. <laughs> it's not considered under the concept of natural flow of events that is of the past, present, and future. In worship, the past and the future are regarded as a direct present. Christ is born, glorify Him. We don't say Christ was born, glorify Him. Christ is born. Christ is risen. The French pastor and theologian George Pidou says, Most usually in worship, time ceases to exist in the form of the past, present, and future. It is changed into a mystical life experience that points to eternity. That is to say that one such event which occurred in some particular space and time has received the power through the active grace of God to be continued even today 
and tomorrow and forever. That's why we shouldn't check our watch when we're in church. <laughs> Let's see how long Bob is going to speak. <laughs> it's the liturgical time. Orthodox iconography, in other words, looking towards worship, is not limited to the static remembrance of the sacred personal events, but rather underlines their living and active presence, raising them to one continuous present. The atmosphere in particular created by the gold backgrounds. The gold background is not just the, in, enhancing the beauty of the icon, but it suggests that existence outside of time or in a continuous present. And I'll give you some examples. You have them even here with the gold background. But this is the Platitera that I showed you before with the beautiful gold background in the Hagia Sophia. This is an icon of the crucifixion in Daphne, Greece. Uh, some beautiful mosaics on Neamoni in Chios as well. Orthodox iconography not only places the divine events in the continual present and thus agrees even in this respect with worship, but also that this art, proven thus to be a purely liturgical <coughs> art, directs the believer to a correct estimation of worship and to the interpretation of its content, says Constantine Kalokidis in The Essence of Orthodox Iconography, another beautiful book about in accordance with the Orthodox teaching about the Church, the interior of the Church is regarded itself as a tri-dimensional icon. When I presented this before, I always did it in church, and it's easier to, um, to show what I'm talking about, but nevertheless, I think you can picture the space of the Church in your mind. The Church is the model of the universe a vision of the redeemed world. The notion that a church is a microcosm becomes obvious when we study the Byzantine cross domed church, when the church is shaped like a cross and the dome is placed where the two arms <coughs> intersect. The cross, of course, symbolizes the Christ cross as well as the four points of the compass, whereas the dome symbolizes the sphere of feather of heaven. In this way, we see that. The, the whole universe is encompassed by cross-redeeming death on the cross. The decorative order is arranged in a strictly hierarchical manner. There are certain icons that go in certain places. We can't just put them the way we feel like. From the top of the dome to the floor. In the dome, Christ Pantocrator is enthroned, the old ruler, the almighty creator, savior and judge. Below the Pantocrator, in this case, in the image that I have here, there's angels, and that's what we have at St. Constantine Helen, um, uh, uh, angels surrounding the Pantocrator. In this dome, and in yours, actually, we have the icons of the prophets of the Old Testament who foresaw the coming of the Savior. While the four corners supporting the dome, or the pendentives, like they're, they're called, are reserved for the evangelists who describe God's visible coming in the form of man. The altar space is the liturgical center of the body of the church. It is reserved, of course, for the clergy serving. The celebrating priest appears as an icon of the high priest, Christ himself, the main celebrant of the divine liturgy. Here is a rendering that we had at St. Constantine before the altar was actually um, decorated with icons. And it shows kind of the elements that I'm going to talk about. The uniting of heaven and earth is manifested to the placing of the Theotokos above. The depiction of Christ celebrating the divine liturgy, which is the, the, the middle um, register. And so from the Panagia, it comes to, towards the holy table, showing us how Christ instituted the Eucharist. And then the theology of the church that came, and the liturgies of the church that came through the Holy Fathers that are depicted usually in the lower register. Now, you're not going to have all of this in all the churches. Depends on how tall the church is. If you, 
if you have those registers, this is normally how it should be. So we can follow the divine descent from the heavenly throne via Mary's womb and lap and down to Christ's grave, which is represented by the holy table. The descent is shown visually with, with the help of the icons and communicated then sacramentally in the partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And then we'll move to the another obvious, I would say, role of the icon, and that is the teaching role of the icons. The icon is didactic. It illustrates and teaches about events and people in Bible and church history. St. John of Damascus said famously, what the book is to the literate, the image is to the illiterate. Because people did not have Bibles. Cool. Now, we have a Bible in every corner of our house. We have Bibles in the drawer when we go to a hotel. But people years ago, they didn't have Bibles. So how would they be able to learn? They will learn many times by seeing the history of the church, the images of the saints, their lives, and of the Theotokos, and of Jesus Christ in the iconography. As well as facilitating knowledge about belief, an image may also stimulate feelings that lead to an inner arousal of belief. St. John of Damascus refers to his own experience when he writes, I saw an icon depicting suffering, and I was unable to pass it without weeping, because what was happening was imparted to me as if it were real. This is the same St. John of Damascus that says, I behold the fortitude of the martyr, the crowns awarded, and my zeal is aroused like fire. I fall down and worship God through the martyr and receive salvation. And St. Photius, Patriarch of, Patriarch of Constantinople says, just as speech is transmitted by hearing, so a form through sight, an icon, is imprinted upon the tablets of the soul giving us a representation of knowledge. It is sometimes so phenomenally easy to explain something when you have, we have an icon in front of you. How do you explain the Holy Trinity? How better can you explain the Holy Trinity than actually looking at the beautiful icon of the Holy Trinity by Andrew Rublev? And there's so many elements, we don't have the time, the time to insist on, on each one of them, uh, in, in this icon, the relationship, the perichoresis, like it's called, the intertwining of the three persons of the triune God is suggested by the circle. See, if you follow the outline of the characters, it's really a perfect circle. The, the, all the, the exact same faces that we see are there suggest the one nature of God. You see also the color blue that all goes throughout the three characters that shows really divinity. We have the colors of the sun who's depicted in the middle. First, you see the order that we have in the, in the creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And see how colors are different because we know more about the sun because he became incarnate. So the colors of his vestments and the, the whole icon is more contrasted. The colors are stronger. As of the Father and the Holy Spirit, it looks almost like the clothing is transparent. See how both the, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit be, behold towards the Father because the Son is born from the Father and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. We see the chalice. There's so many elements that talk to us about what the Holy Trinity is. And the icon is really helping us to do that. And because we wanted to learn directly from the source. <laughs> we actually went to, the, to Moscow with his eminence, uh, to the Tretiako Gallery, where the original icon of the Holy Trinity by Rublev is being displayed. So we were both blessed. I took the picture. I was behind the camera. <laughs> Now, this one is really dear to me. This is an icon of the Last Judgment at the Orthodox Monastery of the Holy Apostles in Capernaum in the Holy Land. 
I also took this picture. And it, it's really beautiful and it's very significant. But it, it, there's a particular scene in here that I wanted to point out to you. And that is, yeah, I wish I could show you this, but um, this area here. This is called, and I, I, will, I will show it to you closer uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, slide. That is called Ozigos Dizikiosinis, which means the balance of righteousness. And it shows how here at the bottom we see the souls. These are the souls of the people who are present to the, to the, uh, to the last judgment. And we have on the left the angels who are putting good deeds on one side of the balance. And then we have the demons on the other side that are trying to pull, pull the balance on that side towards the bad deeds. And um, we see how they're trying to push the balance down so that the souls will be taken on that side, which is the which is hell, instead of going on the, this side, which is heaven. But what was interesting and it was explained to me was the upper part of this, the balance of 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 righteousness, where we see this hand that holds the balance, and if we look closer. In the hand, there are small babies. And on the left and right, these are St. Joachim and Anna. And they are praying. They are praying on their knees fervently. And that is the hand of God. And in that hand are the souls of those children who died before they had a chance to be either born or baptized. And uh, many times I get that question, what, what happens to those children? They were not baptized, or they were aborted, and they died. What happens to those souls? And as we see, they're not in hell, because the hell is on that part. They may be not quite in heaven either, but what we know, and that to me is phenomenal description, they are in God's hand. And how beautiful this is expressed through iconography that those souls are in God's hand. And they are on the fervent prayers from St. Joachim and Anna, whom we know couldn't have children, and they prayed fervently that God gives them a child, and they were able to have the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. There's another icon that to me, stuck with me when, I, when we visited. I was in the seminary, and we visited the monasteries in the eastern, northeastern part of Romania, which is called Moldavia, not the Republic of Moldavia, but it's the province of Romania. And at the monastery of Voronets, there's on the outside, on the uh, eastern wall, is this again, the scene of the Last Judgment. And the monk explained to us something that, that kind of stuck with me, that was so extraordinarily expressed in in iconography, it's hard to express it otherwise. And that is this upper part of the scene. When we see this, this is the com second coming of Christ and the last judgment, of course. But at the top, we see this image of the angels who are, you can see here, the angels are rolling a scroll. They are kind of folding it as if it's done. It doesn't need to be used anymore. A scroll on which the zodiac signs are depicted. And what does that mean? It means, the way we were explained, it means the end of time. Time becomes relevant when now we live in eternity. Time becomes irrelevant. It's not important anymore. Time is important for us. We count our days and years because we die, right? But when we become at the second coming of Christ, now we will live in eternity. Time becomes irrelevant. And I don't want to talk too much about that, but in, in, that, in that mindset, I was thinking about these disputes about the calendar, old calendar, new calendar, as if the calendar is a dogma. You cannot have a dogma of something <coughs> that is temporary. Time is it's, it's a temporary kind of value. It will end when Christ comes. So it cannot be a dogma. So to me, all these discussions maybe should be 
reevaluate it and try and unite rather than divide based on calendar discussions. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> and then the fourth and the last role that I wanted to point out tonight is the sacramental role of the icon, interceding grace. Now, when we see this, how do we call this, M? Icon. Icon. And when we see it on our desktop screen and you click it once or twice, depending on the operating system that you have, then what happens? A program opens. A program opens. A new universe, right? Something else opens through this thing that we call icon. In the same way, Orthodox iconography connects us to the world regenerated by divine grace. The world where the unsetting light of God dominates. Christ, says Solroness again in the mystical language of icons, is the perfect icon from whom the saints gather their radiance, and the man-made icon is in turn, in its turn, shall reflect this divine radiance. Saint Paul, in the Epistle to the Hebrews, sums up the main features in the history of salvation when he writes, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. When Moses asked to see God's splendor, he was told, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. God's inner being, or essence, usia in Greek, is absolutely inaccessible to men. When God communicates with the help of speech or other supernatural phenomena, it is as an example that he makes himself known through this, his powers or energies, Dina says St. Gregory Palamas, talking about the uncreated energies of God. The icon is a piece of transformed matter with a sacramental character, a physical sign of a divine presence. The value of two icons in elevating the faithful to a spiritual level of experience and existence does not come from their nature, from their material, but from the grace and power of God which dwells in them. St. John of Damascus remarks, in their lifetime the saints were filled with the Holy Spirit, and after their death, too, the grace of the Holy Spirit abides always in their souls, or in their bodies in the tombs, and also in their forms and holy icons, not in essence, but as grace and energy. From that indwelling power and energy comes that miraculous powers that comes through many icons that are known as miracle working icons. Potentially, every true icon is miracle working. That potentiality, however, is actualized only when certain conditions, such as the presence of deep religious faith, are fulfilled. So it's not magic. It's not magic has to be a together working of our prayer and devotion with the grace of the Holy Spirit that comes through the icon. The divine element can enter the icon from the time it is painted in as much as the making of the icon involves God's active participation. Divine grace, says Fotis Contoglu, the famous iconographer, divine grace illumines the mind of the iconographer and guides his, saint, his hand. That is why the ancient iconographers seldom signed their works, interesting, and those who did wrote, through the hand of the sinful servant of God. So they attributed their work ultimately to God who guided their hand into writing the icon. The true iconographer prepares himself for his work by fasting, prayer, and other spiritual practices, and has the feeling that he is but an instrument through which the Holy Spirit expresses itself. 
The Holy Spirit does not abandon soul. The material nature of man who reaches that theosis. This is the theology behind the relics of the saints. The relics, the material belongings of the saints, like chairs, beds, clothing, crosses, icons, are forever energized by the presence of the Holy Spirit. You might have heard about the bed of Saint Nectarios that was able to perform miracles even after the saint was taken off from him. It is worth mentioning here, I want to mention this story to you. This is told by Dr. Dimitrios Tselegidis, professor of dogmatics of the theological department of the University of Thessaloniki. His doctoral dissertation was on the theology of icons. At some point, Dr. Tselegidis visited an elder in a convent in northern Greece. This elder happened to be blind by birth, although he was 100% blind. His spiritual vision was 20-20. After visiting with him and discussing various ecclesiastical topics, Professor Tselegidis expressed some curiosity about the elder's cell. Their dialogue was this. Now, elder, I know that you are totally blind. Why then do you have dozens of icons on the walls of your cell? Dimitri, the elder said, because of their grace. Elder, I understand that. I know that the icons are windows of grace and that they somehow bring us closer to the saint they depict when we venerate them. But in your case, you cannot see. Wouldn't one or two icons be enough for you to venerate since you really don't know which icon you are venerating? Dimitri, of course I know which icon I venerate. Each icon has its own distinct grace. St. Irene has one grace, St. Barbara has her own grace, and St. Nicholas is altogether a different grace. The professor and his companions were in disbelief. Elder, I'm sorry, but I have a difficult time believing this. Do you mind if we do a little test? Would you please tie your hands behind your back so I can bring you an icon to venerate? Dr. Tselegidis takes an icon off the wall and places it on the elder's lips to venerate. Oh, Dimitri, this is St. Catherine the Great. Oh, I'm sorry, Elder, but I think you made a mistake in this case. I hate to tell you, but I think that I took St. Barbara off the wall. I think you made a mistake. My dear Dimitri, the grace of St. Catherine is totally different. Trust me, I know St. Barbara very well. <laughs> Go ahead and read the name on the, of the icon. The professor was flabbergasted when he saw that the icon was that of St. Catherine the Great. This head professor, Tselegidis, and his company in tears and quite humble. The purity and ascetical struggle of this blind elder transformed his inner vision. How was the blind monk able to differentiate between the icons of different saints? He was a saint himself. He was able to see the grace that was coming in a different way from different icons of saints. We all remember the story of the woman of the flow of blood that was healed by Christ. Not because of his work, not because of his touch, but because she touched the, the fringes, the tassels on Jesus' cloak. Here then, is the theology of the icon, and of the relics of the saints, if you will. The icons are like the fringes of the Lord's cloak. In orthodoxy, in both Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition, we have not only the Lord with his garment intact, but all the fringes of the Lord's cloak, and these fringes, the icons, are still miraculous today. This is the role of the icons, to beautify, to teach, to help us serve and pray and intercede for us, God's grace. Thank you.
may we consider the icon as a container of race files which is increasing from the iconographer to the worshippers along the same yeah, whatever, whatever time. May we consider an icon a window of grace? That is the question. Can you consider it as a container of grace? As a continual grace. Container. Container. Container of grace. I'm sorry. Yes, now I understand. Yes. Um, that is part of what I talked in this last point where I said that the role of the icon is that to intercede the grace. But you are correct, that starts, and I maybe mention it briefly, it starts from the time the icon is being written. It starts with the preparation of the, of the iconographer. Right. It starts with the prayer and fasting. It starts with inspiration from God, who, as Kasi Kabarma said, guides the hand of the iconographer. And then, when the icon is being displayed for veneration in the church, it continues with what we said, a synergy, a collaboration between the people's faith and their prayers and the grace that come from that <coughs> container like you described it yourself. Yeah, but in addition to that, you have the individual worshippers. Some individuals that yeah. may worship that icon and increases the amount of grace. Absolutely, and that, that's exactly what we said. And you, we have to be careful to not say worship, because as we said, worship is, is dedicated only to God. We venerate the icons, and as we venerate them, the amount of prayer, humility, dedication that we bring in front of the icon increases, just like you said, the amount of grace that the icon can intercede for us. And a connection to that, can we consider the icon, let's say, like a sacred remains of the saint. I mentioned also the uh, the uh, relics of the saints. They can also be, like you said, containers of grace. Because that, that holiness that comes to us from God, it doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God who gives us that grace because of our efforts, because of us being close to the church because of our prayer, fasting, charity, that grace continues after death. It still comes from God, but it becomes like a mirror. You know, the lips and the icons become like a mirror through whom the grace of God continues to, to work. Like I mentioned, the bed of St. Nectarius, who even now continues to perform miracles because of the saint and because of the grace of God that comes through it. Yes, Adam. So what about icons that are prints that are then pasted onto wood and have been uh, miracle working, as opposed to ones that have been directly painted or written by iconographers? And then to that same tune, what about iconographers that aren't worthy or aren't uh, practicing fasting, asceticism, ascetic practices? Are their icons not worthy, uh, and can the grace not be transmuted through their, the, those icons? That's, that's a very good question, and I, I've got the question before. People say, well, you know, we talk about icons painted in a certain way, with prayer, fasting, and it starts the proper way, so to say, with the icon that's properly written. And you have a good foundation with that icon to start receiving that grace. Now, when, when you don't have any of those proper icons, and you have a piece of paper with an icon on it, or a calendar that has an icon in the middle of it, can you pray in front of that? And can you receive the grace of God through that icon that's in front of you? What do you think? Yes. I believe yes. Absolutely. I believe yes. Because it is, like we said, a synergy, a together working between the grace of God and the person in front of icon that prays. Now, we know that there are certain icons that have proven themselves either mercy streaming or miracle working for in many, many instances. And some of those are having that right foundation that we talked about. But we don't exclude miracles that can 
be performed through a Nikon printed on a piece of paper. And in that same idea, people ask me, well, what should we do sometimes? You know, we have bulletins that have icons printed on them. And now what do we do with those icons? You know, it's really hard. We're going to become borders if we, if we say they've ever seen a piece of paper that has an icon on it. I would encourage in that case, if, you, if that paper, like a bulletin, has fulfilled its purpose, try and shred it. You know, we all have a shredder these days. If he has an icon on it and it, it done its purpose, you can shred it. I'm not going to say paste it on all the walls in your in your house just because it has an icon depicted on it. Father Taylor, yes. my father Paul has a burn uh, collection. He has a so burn he, collection? Yeah, so he brings it to the monastery and he gets burned. So. We have, a, we have a holy trash bin too, <laughs> where we put things that need to be burned. Actually, we, we give them to a funeral home that we work most of the time with, and they, they take it and they put it in the crematorium, hopefully not with the body. <laughs> and what, yes? You mentioned that in the churches, the icons are in specific places. Mm -hmm. Are all churches then with the icons in the same places in the same churches, or are they in some church you might have certain ones there, in another church there's a different arrangement? Or are they all this icon goes in this corner, this icon goes in that corner? There's a term that's called eremia, which is a a term that describes a certain toxic, a certain order in which the icons should be placed in the church. Now as you well mentioned, different churches have different architecture. Some of them, as we know, some, some churches don't even have a dome. So where are you going to put the Pandokrabi? So we try to do our best to follow the Erminia of the church. If you have a dome, you're not going to put in there the icon of St. Constantine and Helen, as much as we love it. You're going to put the icon of the Pandokrabi, because that's where it goes. That's where, then what the dome suggests, the presence of God. And God came to us through Jesus Christ. And then, as I described to you, that descent from the dome through the Theotokos and left and right of the Theotokos, if you have that architectural element, you can put the Annunciation scene, because that's when the Theotokos was told that she was chosen to give birth to Christ. And then through the Platypera, and then, like I, I showed you, the uh, institution of the Eucharist. The Holy Fathers who established the theology and the old points towards the Holy Table and the altar where the Eucharist happened. So if you have those architectural elements, it is advisable and it is good to place them there. And that, that's why normally when an iconography project happens, the local church doesn't do that without on their own. Because they might make those kind of mistakes to put an icon in the wrong place. That's why usually the project is being presented to the diocese, his eminence approves it, or he suggests changes for that particular project in accordance to the Erminia, to the um, toxi or the order that we have in the church. So we do our best to, fo to follow the tradition of the church, but Various architectural, uh, uh, various uh, architectural styles might call for maybe skipping or not having one of the elements that I mentioned. This is the ideal scenario that I present. And of course, you have icons, the iconostasis. You're always going to have Christ on the right as you look at the iconostasis, the, the, the Theotokos on the left, the icon of Saint John the Baptist, the icon, the festal icon of the church next to the Theotokos. You're always going to have that. It would be a mistake to try and put different icons there. But then past that, see, in your church, have, you have more icons. So in that case, you know, the local church, the committee, the priest, decides what those icons will be. In our church, we have two extra icons. On the left, we decided to put St. Nicholas for whatever reason. <laughs> and then on the other side, we put St. Anthony the Great, who is the, one of the founders of monasticism. So certain elements, you can choose what to put in certain places of the church, but some are set for certain places. Well, thank you all. You're very interesting. Thank you so much for
Thank you, Deborah. And um, thank you all for coming. We also want to thank His Eminence for his blessing during the liturgy today and also for blessing us with having a meal with us. Now, we've got four more Lenten lectures, so I want to um, I want to tell you about next week. We titled it A Day in the Life of an Iconographer. And so Father Taylor has told us several things about iconographers themselves. We're going to get to meet one next week. Her name is Effie Phyllis. And she is actually going to show us the different stages of how she makes an icon and of what her life is like as an iconographer. Um, I, is there anything else that needs to be announced? Or anybody can think of anything? No? Okay, good. I have some flyers that anybody wants to take on home, and everybody drive home safely, and thank you so much. Thank you.